Vata to present your work on smart building analytics and applications. Just a sec. Keep on entertaining the people while yeah. I set up the. <laughs> Maybe you should give some introduction about yourself. Right. Yes, okay. <clears throat> so as Nazia mentioned, I'm Anas Fatah. And uh, just so you're all aware, I will be pacing a lot. So if it gets out of hand, just let me know. Laugh <laughs> or just snap your fingers or something. That also works. Uh, so, yes. okay, thanks. So the project title, or what I'm going to present about, the title is going to be Smart Building Analytics and Applications. I'm going to start with introducing the team. The team is three of us. We're three students from TUT, Tampere University of Technology, and the University of Tampere. Uh, we have uh, Omer here. And Dali Omer is a data scientist, and he's handling all the data. Uh, involved and the back end development. As for Ali, he is doing the, the back end and front end integration. And as for me, I'm handling the communication for the team and the coordination of the project as well as the user experience. This team was put together by Flowworks, by uh, UC mainly, and uh, it, the idea of putting this team together was to get uh, a project, an exploration project for SOOC, which is the Finnish University, uh, Finnish University properties. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with them. They uh, produce, maintain, and develop premises for universities, colleges, and their partners here in Finland. In uh, most of Finland, except for Helsinki, I believe. Uh, they are currently working with 14 or 15 other companies uh, on the project Vir Sorry, on the project Virpasi. And it is about, uh, about Internet of Things with the buildings and the new campuses and bringing them closer to the users, as in the students and the faculty at each of those universities, and helping them integrate uh, their knowledge and their experience within the buildings with what they are building now. And this is where our project comes in. Some of those new campuses is the Campus Arena in TUT, and it is collecting data that is not currently being used by uh, for anything the idea for having it was to do uh, building automation and to uh, find just different uses for it and that's where we came in to find those uses and try to come up with proof of concepts for them this data is collected by different vendors mainly uh, the, the ones we are dealing with now are siemens and helvar and uh, we were provided by multiple resources for the project the uh, Siemens API Navigator, the Helvar API, and an API that uh, we've built, uh, well, uh, Ali and Demir built, and the pre-existing 3D model uh, provided by Soup. You can see uh, a screenshot from like the, the one floor that we chose to work with for our proof of concept. Scratching uh, a bit deeper, digging a bit deeper into the surface of each of those APIs, we start with the Siemens API services. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the data is collected for building automation, and we have chosen the data types that are most relevant to our work. And those were room temperatures in that floor that we were provided, campus will be the fifth floor in campus arena, CO2 emission for each of those rooms, and occupancy status and we wanted to visualize this data in a way that is uh, useful usable for members or students we faced uh, some flaws dealing with uh, each of the two apis that we've had and uh, with siemens it was we have discovered that it's not handling missing data even though the data is generated with a constant frequency. The indication for that flow was that we manually reconstructed the missing timestamps. And uh, the, there's a lot of two things that are way too technical for me, but you can ask Omer later about and he will tell you in detail. It's much more useful. Uh, and the, the API also fails to return anything after the fifth page, which was uh, fixed by manually generating a new URL from the last retrieved timestamp after every fifth call. 
Uh, another issue that we faced with it is that uh, it records data every five minutes for each of the rooms for every data meter. However, it updates the API every one hour with an even longer delay, making the last recorded value unusable when it comes to real-time uses and visualization. However, for that case, we've, we're only showing the last recorded value until uh, a predictive model is complete and usable uh, to show the real-time data that is useful. As for the help of API services, it is currently available for anyone, uh, if they check the link, it's available there with multiple services. And uh, with, with more advantages, such as the update frequency is every 30 seconds for each event. However, the data collected by Helvar is just motion-based, since they are a light company. And the, the motion sensors are there to help with automating the lighting system in each of the rooms. However, it ha uh, the data collection was not very useful when it came to historical data and machine learning when it comes to knowing which rooms are most popular because the data only got collected or it began being collected just about a month ago and during July everyone's off like everyone's having vacation so we didn't get the data that we needed to get historical uses historical data uses from it. Uh, Helmer was very transparent with dealing with us, and uh, they have uh, actually noted that the missing there will be missing data due to connectivity issues, which they will be working on fixing. Uh, we use we're using Helmer API for real time applications, which I will get into more in just a bit. For the application has been set in a way that uh, the missing data do not really affect it. You know, in such a bad way, and it remains usable. Uh, the lack of sensor mapping, uh, in com because we're using the, the 3D model to uh, visualize everything, we need to know each sensor exactly where it is on the floor. And that was not provided in the API, so we had to do that manually for each of the sensors in each of the rooms. Uh, Helper is used for the most part with us. It has higher reliability, transparency, and cooperation from the company as well. Uh, the API is constantly updated whenever we have a request for a new update in the API. The, the, the developer from Helper's part has been very responsive and very helpful with that, keeping everything up to the highest bars. Uh, with Siemens, there is there's only a few rooms are covered with the sensors. So the, the final application looked a bit lacking, which we were able to mitigate with Helvar's data as well. Uh, however, since only motion uh, event-based data is provided by Helvar, Siemens is used for temperature and uh, the air freshness of each room, the status, how healthy it is for people to use it. As for the in-house API, it, uh, the details of what is used in the coding, Python, and the other frameworks could be, and the, when we go to the questions, Omer could uh, say so much about that. However, it is used, it features two main services. The main Uh, status of that one floor, Campus Kluby, and uh, the other one is historical data, uh, also from Siemens, and the application is to know which rooms are most popular and to know what sort of uses, uh, how, how effectively used each room has. Our initial ideas uh, with such a learning process exploration project there were so many ideas flowing around from the very first meeting. How could we uh, use the temperature and the data in a way that is adjustable and very useful to, to have a preference-based room to each user? However, with the resources and the issues that we faced, we found that to be not very practical. First of all, it was noticed that within a floor the temperature is, uh, the changes are very, very small and uh, they are not very effective or useful. Uh, the resources were not acquired yet 
at the very first meeting, so the expectations were very high from the project as a whole. And we all, all that was asked from us is to achieve a proof of concept and find uh, the flaws of the APIs, which we have managed to do. Uh, after getting the help of our data, we have decided to make a pivot with our uh, direction with the prototype. And that went into occupancy because it is, uh, at the nearest future point, it is the most usable for students and faculty alike. And I would like to show you. Probably will not work. Probably will not work. Yeah. OK. Is there absolutely no way to show the video? I'm reluctant, but let's try. OK. <laughs> to fail fast and hardly. <laughs> There it is. Just a second, I'll take the online people with us. Is it that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Where did it go? Over there. Let's settle with this one. Yeah. Do you need voice? No, no. Uh, this is the most recent build from our prototype. This is the floor with the 3D model. And uh, this is the idle state. Once you interact with it, it moves to the top view. You click on occupancy, and it takes some time to, to generate. The red rooms are the occupied rooms. In, it is shown in real time, and it updates every 30 seconds. We have three, and when you go into each room, it shows further details about that room, such as the name, the last recorded value for the temperature, and uh, the CO2 emission value, which is now shown in percentage. However, will be changed into how healthy the room is and how fresh the air is in that room at, that, at any given moment. Uh, yeah, how uh, can I go back to the presentation? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Oh. Uh, we have added the uncertainty uh, uh, the uncertainty mode to add reliability to the to the application just in case someone is just going to the bathroom or just checking a room. Uh, things to add by the end of August are things I've already sort of mentioned. Uh, as you can see, we we're going to use the 24-hour predictions as a weather forecast sort of thing, and also to uh, fix to adjust the last recorded value to something more real time than an hour ago. As for the value created, it's a, it works as a proof of concept for indoor temperature forecasts, better understanding of the rooms and how effectively they are used. That is a value created for the management. And knowing what rooms are occupied, also, uh, I believe that's especially relatable in Finland, that you don't want any awkward encounters with people in meetings or so. Uh, as the project, if it's picked up for uh, further development, it could go. Uh, it could include the reservation system of the whole uh, university campus and be more Im implemented on mobile devices uh, with the students as well to use for their daily use of the campus. As noise data included and sentiment analysis for each of the study rooms. And uh, that's it. Thanks. Uh, any questions? Uh, there's all, you can ask more technical questions because Ali and Dwayne will also be able to answer. So you took uh, you took the prototype of Campus Arena building, or yes. on the second floor where there is like the fifth floor. Fifth floor. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
uh, did you think about uh, considering temperature when there is like a change in temperature data when there is like already an occupied room and there are people over there because I think the more people you have in a room the emission of carbon dioxide extent yes which uh, when using the app we've actually noticed that that when a room is occupied the co2 emission percentage is higher yeah as for the temperatures uh, because of the regulations they're always like limited to a very range yeah. so it doesn't really go that much higher maybe maximum i believe half a degree or maybe a degree tops that we've noticed so far. Yes, almost between 21 and 23 like yeah. never goes beyond 400 Right. I have two questions. Yes. The biggest quest, uh, biggest problems with the APIs that you had during your implementation. What were the problems? Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of problems? Uh, yeah. Um, can, can you come here too, so the voice actually goes to the net? So yeah. speak here somewhere. So as um, mentioned by Anis, that we uh, face some challenges with the API. Uh, so the, the, the very first thing that we noticed was that uh, we weren't getting enough data despite mentioning the time stamps correctly. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we had to like manually fix that. Uh, so what we did was we like after every five the light, the last timestamp and we took the timestamp and recreated the request and uh, continued to do that till the very end. So that was like our manual hack to, to, to fix that. Uh, second, there, there was no option to actually tell the, who's responsible for the API to fix it. Yeah, we, we actually wrote them and we, we just like asked them if you guys can you know, fix it ASAP. And they were like, you know, the development team is in another country. So, you know, it's going to take We faced a lot of cooperation. <laughs> okay. So we were like, okay, so let's not. Let this thing bog us down. So we went with the with the manual hack. So secondly, uh, uh, initially we were the, the inspiration was to uh, develop a predictive model for indoor temperature. So when it comes to prediction, when it comes to machine learning, we, we need like a ginormous amount of data. But unfortunately, that was missing because uh, our primary API, which we were counting on, was uh, Siemens and they only they, they, they only had data for last three months. So ideally, you wouldn't want to train a model which would sort of uh, overfit the data from which it has uh, learned. So you would want like historical data, and in when it comes to uh, temperature forecasting, temperature predictions, uh, the research papers I have read. They usually use like uh, like data that spans over a decade or a decade and a half. Uh, so unfortunately, we didn't have enough data, but we tried uh, to use the data we had, and we managed to come up with with a with a, with a working uh, predictive model. And uh, we we sort of moved on from that because. Uh, our idea was to just give a proof of concept that there's okay, this can be done. Given you have enough data, the accuracy of this predictive model can be improved. So these were the challenges we, we, we faced. Uh, yeah, missing data. Uh, so they, they have like a constant frequency with which they're, they're getting data and the API returns the data. But it just turned out that. Uh, for the timestamps, they don't have any data. Uh, the, the API is the, the API doesn't indicate any information about those. Those timestamps are like completely missing. So the you know uh, an ideal implementation would be timestamp and then telling us for some reason, for some weird reason, uh, the data is not available. It could be because of the, the, the sensors are off because of maintenance or there's no internet or it could be so many different just so that the, the recipient could know that okay this is a timestamp and there's no data available so for that we we had to use different uh, imputation techniques uh, like forward filling take the last uh, 
uh, take the last value of the last uh, time stamp and just fill forward. Uh, and then there was another one uh, which was to replace, re replace uh, missing values with uh, the average of the whole data set. So we, we, we went with the average one. Um, so, yeah, that's so sounds to me that uh, if they actually provide you any kind of documentation for the API. Yeah, unfortunately, although the, the API was very simple, uh, the, 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 there wasn't any documentation uh, provided. Would, that, would it help to do? Actually, it would have helped uh, had there been a documentation, at least for the, for the missing value uh, part, because uh, it was just like, um, since, uh, when you are uh, training uh, deep networks, they're like very regimental about the number of data points and the batch size. So I sort of found it by accident uh, that, okay, there is something wrong with the data because data from different sensors, they're not adding up, then the, the amount of data is not the same. So uh, I, I, on the other hand, I think that had there been documentation, they would have already fixed the missing value problem and the, the um, like insufficient data points problem. Because obviously, this is something uh, you know, whoever has developed the API has overlooked these issues. It's not by like they, they haven't done it like on purpose. So had there been documentation, had they had they been that detail oriented, they would have already fixed these problems. All right. Also, if I may, uh, there's another problem considered like related to the hierarchy. As you, as you know, we're not already we are dealing with buildings, and buildings means rooms and floors, and rooms. And uh, what what we noticed is from the provider's perspective, they don't need this notion of this physical notion of rooms on floors. They consider the old building as one entity and they did only deal with the, with the IPs basically. So when we, are, we were using Siemens and Helper IP I both, they, it was very hard for us to know where the sensors are. Even though Helper's IPI were, was pretty reliable, it was pretty much uh, useless for us without this very specific information. Where is the sensor? So we couldn't uh, like at first, we couldn't use those information without this like hierarchy. Where it is the sensors? Yeah, and uh, even though internally it didn't make any sense to for them to make this rooms a uh, rule notion to make the API usable, it's necessary for uh, like to create it. So yeah, that's one of the biggest problems we faced. And what was the fix? Yeah, uh, the fix was manually yeah, map <laughs> everything. Yeah. And since the uh, we were only working with the with one floor, it took us uh, a lot of time just to map two hundred sensors in one floor. And the idea is to expand this to all buildings, and that's why a standard system or process is necessary. Uh, without the standard. The, there's no way of expanding this to all buildings. And yeah, it was such a pain to do it for just one floor. So it's really impossible to do it for all buildings. Yeah. I mean, is it so that there are no standards on this area? For the data models of the APS systems? In the, for the industry standards? The, they, they have their, their standards, but the, if we want, we want to link the, the information they have, with the physical world, they don't have like a real link between them. So we had to guess based on, for example, a description or uh, ask them where is this sensor, and we had to search on the plans for the building. So it took us a lot of manual work just to guess where the sensors are. Yeah, because like physically, we, we understand uh, the notion of a room, right? So it's like a physical. A square or rectangular area, and they are like one, two, three, four, five sensors. But it was 
I wouldn't say it was like completely absent in the API, but it was very weak. Or um, uh, and other than that, there was no way to access it like through an API. This information, you you you'd have to go uh, the navigate a dashboard and look at it, and it's just like it's there, but it's not programmatically accessible. How all these installations are mapping is such difficult to how old are I mean how long time the installation has been uh, I think uh, campus arena is uh, a fairly new building because it was inaugurated uh, back in 2015 so yes. two, two, two years or so so after since they didn't know uh, which sensor is, is uh, uh, named or uh, identified. Oh, well, what we've noticed is that uh, when when they've been placed, the use for these sensors and data was not what we're doing. It was more about building automation. In which case, I believe when they did their studies, it was not necessary to do the mapping. And this project.